Hello. Thanks for joining me. I'm Javier. I'm the CEO of the Stuttgart-based web agency Anders und Seher. And I'm going to do a talk right now about selling responsive designs. But to make that absolutely clear, I am not talking about selling your customers things they don't need. I'm talking about selling responsive designs that have a benefit. I, I really love crazy things like uh, going on holiday where the NASA test drives their Mars rovers, for example, or founding the web agency more than 10 years ago. My passion is photography, which sometimes is crazy too, and I really love going close to dangerous things. Well, sometimes I climb up active volcanoes, but really, and to be honest, the craziest thing I ever did was agree yesterday, yesterday afternoon, to do this talk right now. And I'm honest again, this is not a talk I had prepared. So all you're going to see was created in the last 24 hours. It's completely new. <laughs> okay. That's the reason why I couldn't join you guys yesterday evening to have some beers. Actually, I was at home working on the structure of this talk. Um, Next year, I'm, I'm going to do it the other way around, prepare the talk earlier, and uh, I hope to have some beers with you guys. We're talking about responsive designs and how to sell them. What is responsive design? Uh, yesterday, I learned that it's a smart and clever way to make a lot of money, which in some way is true. <laughs> Jochen, uh, you're not here. Well, thanks for the picture. Your picture is down there on the lower left corner. Um, I, I wasn't in that talk, actually. Um, I saw that photo on Facebook and well, my first thought was, yeah, yeah, in, in a way that's really true. Um, a lot of customers end up with responsive websites and I don't know if they ever have a peek into analytics to see how much traffic is really done with smartphones and which might be even more important, how much conversions come from smartphones. A lot of customers, and I, I guess you, you guys know that, um, if you go into a pitch situation, their approach is everything should work on a smartphone. Each and every function should be available there because the mobile market is growing. Facebook, maybe you saw that yesterday created more than 60% more revenue compared to last year, and a lot of that mobile. Does it really have to be that way? No. <laughs> Some of you are shaking their heads, so I'm glad you do so. To me, that sounds kind of dogmatic. <laughs> Did I mention that I love controversial things too? <laughs> well, let's have a peek. 
to do a responsive project, a website or an online shop, has a lot of implications through the whole creation process of your project. It actually starts when you do planning and analysis for the project. It has huge implications when you start to do wireframes, and I hope you do wireframes. Um, even more implications on graphics, and it creates a lot of work for the developers, we all know that. Um, what a lot of people tend to forget is when our work is done, when we typo three developers and agencies, when we deliver the project to the customer, the work might be done for us, but he starts, the customer starts to work with the system. He starts to edit content. You'll have to do support for it. And um, someone should do web controlling on that. And that changes a lot when you're doing responsive projects. That's an example for wireframes. We, that, that's a project we're currently working on. And you see on the left side, that is the medium-sized version of it. It's the, the home page, so there's a big slider here and some teasers below that. And you can see here the mobile wireframe. The slider is smaller and those teasers can go one below the other. Um, so you can clearly see at least it's double the work to be done here at that stage. <clears throat> there are some other implications. For example, this is a B2B website. And I, I love to say that this whole project is done for that little form in the upper left corner. That is lead generation. That's why the customer does that project at all. <laughs> when, if, if he had other ways to generate leads, maybe he, he would not do a website at all. And it's a good idea to put that form in a, on a position where it's clearly visible and you don't have to think a lot about how to get in touch with those guys. So upper left corner might be a good position for that. When you do um, wireframes for a responsive project, you have to take care of such issues, um, for conversions. So where do they go on a mobile phone? In that case, this went the form went below um, the content. And there are some other elements, like that teaser on the left or those links on the right side. They are completely omitted um, in the smartphone version of the website. When it comes to graphic, it's the same again. So in that case, you'll have to do several designs for several devices, depending on the number of breakpoints you're actually using. So it, it's a lot more work for your graphics department, for your art direction, and at the same time, and art directions hate this, they, you lose control of design in some way. So it's nearly impossible to do a website that looks really good in each and every device you could imagine. It's a lot of work to be done there. And as constantly new devices are released with new resolution features, whatever, it's not going to get any better. That's where all the magic happens. Developers, of course, have to deal with media queries and stuff like that, and retina images. I do not really understand what's there. That's not my job. That's your job here. <laughs> Later, when it comes to editing content, work is, tends to get more complex for website editors, too. The screenshots you're seeing here are taken from the General Electric website. And I don't know if you had a look at that website in, in recent months. They did a complete relaunch. It's, 
It looks like that, more or less. And as you can see here, there are some implications. Look, for example, at that slider here on top of it. It really looks great for the medium version of the website, so the main object of that photography is clearly visible. It transports a message. On the mobile version, I don't know. It's not that good. And to be honest, I doubt if that website is um, really used a lot mobile. I, I mean, not used in a way that someone opens it and, okay, it's there. I mean, using it really, like navigate on it. I don't know. There are some other issues too. Um, this is a screenshot of a website um, that was done by DKD. They did a great job, don't get me wrong. Um, but as you can see here, there are always some issues like um, text that is longer than expected. And this tends to get more complex when you're dealing with international projects. So if you start off with an English website, um, Translating that to German usually means that text length is going to grow around 25%. And if you're doing French, Italian, or Spanish translations, you'll end up with another 25% of that. This is normally no issue on a computer screen, and not even on a tablet computer, but on a smartphone, it gets a little bit tricky. For editors, there are other issues. For example, when dealing with pictures. A good picture that works on every device has kind of interesting stuff here in the middle and a lot of good-looking stuff that is not interesting around it. That's the perfect image for a responsive website. In an ideal world, all the images would look like that. As we all know, the world is not ideal. So we end up with content looking like on the general electric website. Another issue is analytics. Um, a lot of customers have a peek into analytics and see how much traffic comes from, well, iOS or Android or um, Windows Mobile. And these tend to be around, well, depending on the customer, between 10 and 50%. It depends on, well, how known that brand is. Um, it depends on in, in which business they are. Of course, there are websites that generate a lot of mobile traffic. Um, it depends on if they do mobile advertising at all. A lot of customers just don't do it, and then they are wondering, we end up with 2% iOS. Why is that the case? And, um, well, what most customers don't do or don't know yet is to really track their conversions and to ask themselves, where do my conversions come from, which might be the most important part of all of that. Do they really come from smartphones? And what is the conversion? For B2B websites, for example, a lot of conversions is filling out forms or going to, uh, to the imprint, legal issues, stuff like that. Okay, let's have a look at some smartphone use cases. Let's say your car breaks down in the middle of nowhere and you need help for it. Would be a good idea to have a responsive website that works good on a smartphone because 
most probably those guys start to get a bit nervous and they just take the first device that it is, is at hand. That's fine, that's a good use case, should be optimized for mobile phones. That one is, it's the ADAC, German Automobile Drivers Association, the biggest here. And I'd say it's not ideal, but it's fairly good. It's okay, makes sense. Another example, let's say you meet with friends and uh, here in Stuttgart, you're coming from Denmark and Romania and I don't know where you, all, you guys come from and you want to go to a restaurant. Good idea to have a smartphone optimized website for that. Very good, okay, check. Next one, you're at a train station and you, you start wondering if that train is really going to leave. <laughs> yeah, happens sometimes in Germany. It's a good idea to have a mobile version for that. Mobile in a sense of works good on a smartphone. Another example, you're climbing up a volcano. It might be handy to know if that volcano might cause trouble today. <laughs> it's really good. Okay. Or, let's say, I know this sounds kind of stupid, but let's say you're at a conference and you'd like to know who the next speaker is. And you're going to love a mobile website like the guys who organized that conference here did. It's really handy. Another example, you're at a do-it-yourself market and you're searching a machine, a tool or something and as you all know, people working at those markets, they are not the smartest guys you're going to find. <laughs> so you made that experience too. <laughs> um, it might be really a useful um, use case to have a smartphone optimized website for a manufacturer of those tools to provide you assistance when you're standing there. And that's an example. It's this one. We were in a pitch here last year. Unfortunately, we did not win. So this project was done by agency in, in Hamburg. I, I don't remember the name. Is anybody here from that agency? No? Well, again, they did a good job, really. I love that project. Here it is. And there's a product finder, so you can select here your task, like putting color on a wall, and your project size, like it's a small project, and here are your, or here are the, the products that might do the job for you. That's really good, easy to use, and it, it really works on a smartphone display. But to be honest, if I had another device at hand in the do-it-yourself market, I'd use the other one. But this is not the case in mostly. Well, here's another task. Find one of 10,000 products that fit your needs. Would you do that on a smartphone? No. You would? No, let's say you don't have any article numbers, you have certain needs, like requirements. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Let's say you're in a B2B situation and you have certain requirements for, um, for your, the pro product you're actually searching. It's really hard to do a kind of um, product assistance for 10,000 products on a smartphone screen. I know this is not true for every customer, so that's 
absolutely clear. Um, but there are a lot of customers that just don't need that stuff. And that is such an example. Um, <laughs> that's a project we did last year and it's not responsive. Um, I plan to show it to you guys and our customers started maintenance work today, so. <laughs> but um, conclusion, in those cases, it's never ever going to be done on a smartphone. I can't imagine that. Another example would be here. That's that customer. That is a configuration utility. So you can add elements here. You can drag them around, stuff like that. It also works. Actually, it works on a smartphone, yes. <laughs> um, but analytics shows us that really nobody except our developers are actually doing that. <laughs> Which is, well, you're doing that on a large screen. That's their target audience. Um, these are engineers. Um, what they do is they are in their office, they plan a project, and they search um, the best products for their project. Okay. What I was trying to say is there are some use cases where it is absolutely clear um, that the target audience is going to use a smartphone. Like when they are on the road, um, when it's time critical, when there, there's low bandwidth conditions and there's no other device at hand. And um, we came to the conclusion responsive does not mean it has to work on a smartphone with all features. It also does not mean that it's mobile. You can do responsive designs for, let's say, small computer screens and large computer screens, and it's going to work fine. That's perfect. Yeah? The tricky thing is the smartphone stuff, yeah? because you have to condense information on a very small screen. And responsive also does not mean touch. It's, yeah, something else. When we're talking about touch devices, there, it comes down to these three types. Well, actually there's four and everything in between, but we're talking mainly about smartphones, small tablets, seven inches, somewhere in between there, and large tablets. Of course, um, new products are, are coming now like um, phablets, somewhere in between smartphones and the seven inch screen, and all sizes between the other two. Um, that's, you'll have to deal some way with that, so make a decision what is going to be visible on a, on a six-inch six phablet. I don't know. We found out when doing tests with our customers that even people with really large hands were able to use a website on a seven-inch tablet computer that was done for a higher resolution. So it, it, it's really working. So somewhere be below seven inch is where you have to go for another approach. For phablets, for example. I don't know. Are you using phablets? <laughs> just one? Oh, just kidding. <laughs> um, they're used in some strange ways like taking photos with the iPad, I just can't, can't get rid of that. Well, <laughs> that's what I mostly do with my iPad. <laughs> Sitting or lying on the sofa and using websites and online shops. So that's not classic mobile use, as I mentioned before. Um, so this table should help you a little bit sorting things out and finding um, the right approach for a website that has no mobile use case at all or just limited mobile use cases. Okay, so the question is for your project, what is your smartphone use case?
that's the idea I, I'd like to transport to you guys. So leave that everything should be available on the smartphone, or at least ask your customers if that is the right approach, because it's going to be far more expensive than going another way. Um, in most cases, for, for example, B2B customers, we end up with something like that. Because analytics shows us the use case on a smartphone is find a telephone number. <laughs> That's it. That's, nobody's going to use it to do complex tasks. If so, they're going to delay it. But it's really pain to use product configurators on a smartphone screen. Nobody's ever going to do that unless you force him to. And of course, in a demo situation when you pitch your responsive design. <laughs> um, here's an example. Contact map. Um, that's how we did it um, on, on seven inch screens, uh, screens and up. It's a nice world map. Um, the customer is able to put uh, hotspots on that map and edit some address data. And of course, this is not going to work on a smartphone in that form. So we need another approach here. Um, what we did is we created um, an accordion that is only visible on the mobile phone. You can easily navigate continents or areas by scrolling, and you can open up each address you might want to, to use now. And there's, there's a link here to the route planner so it's really easy to, to go there because that was the mobile use case for this customer <laughs> addresses. That was it. And it's really the thing that is, that is mostly used. To edit that, um, the standard typo three features are probably not going to work. So you have to do something else like creating an address database and um, edit your addresses there. And both views I showed you right now are generated out of that database. At our support hotline, we get constant calls <laughs> like telling us, um, yeah, listen, um, it's me, Max. I'm usually, I'm usually editing news for the website, but now I have to change an address. Where is that? <laughs> yeah, of course, it's in a folder somewhere where this guy has never been before. And that's what I meant. It tends to make things more complicated for um, website editors. They need to be more experienced, and not everybody's able to do that. I expect that to be much better with type of free NEOS. What I saw yesterday might be a very, very good approach for that. Okay, that's the message. When you're doing a responsive project, think about your mobile use case. Am I, I mean, a mobile use case on a smartphone that really makes sense. And maybe you're going to end up with something like that, small, version of the website, optimized for smartphones, of course, fed from the normal content database, and start doing the responsive stuff for devices seven inches and up. And this is going to work fine in most cases, because what we mainly do is budget should go where the conversions are. Yes, sure. <laughs> okay, that's it for now. I'm done. <laughs> Are there any questions? We have some minutes left. No questions at all. Or you guys want to go to a restaurant? <laughs> okay, thank you. See you soon.